The PlayStation 1 is known for its low-poly models, and in looking at some of the famous characters at the time, you can almost count how many vertices are being used. Characters in these games could use anywhere between 500 to 1200 polygons, which may seem like a lot, but when you compare them to modern character models, they're easily dwarfed in comparison. PS1 models may look incredibly simplistic, however, sometimes simplicity is deceptively hard to achieve. However, with a little bit of know-how, practice, and some tricks, you can learn how to get started and hopefully create any low-poly model you want in Blender. And today, I want to share with you some of the tricks that I use. This tutorial series is going to assume that you don't really have any experience using Blender or 3D modeling at all, so I'm going to go into detail about certain commands, how modifiers work, and really basic stuff like edge flow and good topology. We're only going to be concerning ourselves with basic technique today. We don't need to worry about advanced modeling, texturing, UV mapping, animation, or output as of yet. And if I did that, this video might go on for eternity. Now, the first thing to consider when it comes to any model of your project, regardless of whether you're doing something as high quality as an HD animated movie, or a low fidelity render of just a single image, the first question that you should ask yourself is, how important is this object going to be for the final product? Main characters in video games normally have more detail than any other elements in the game, whereas some things can literally just be represented by a 2D sprite and just left at that. And since we're replicating the PlayStation 1, we can't really get too complex, but we can decide whether or not something needs that just extra touch or not. Before I actually get started modeling, I want to go over some fundamentals briefly, as we'll need to establish some limitations to keep in mind moving forward. Modeling is simply recreating real objects with points that are connected in space. These points are called vertices, and they're essentially the atoms of the 3D world. An edge is a connection between two vertices, and a connected set of edges form a face. These faces make up the surface of every object in a 3D world. The most basic face is a tri, consisting of only three verts. In a game, objects are rendered in tries, and when it comes to poly count, these are what we're looking to reduce. Now, I'm not an expert. But Wikipedia says that at max, the PlayStation and its hardware can only handle 360,000 flat-shaded polygons. However, I've read on forums that people say that due to a lack in memory, it can only really handle up to about 150,000 polys in any given render, which still seems like a lot to me. However, that number actually gets even smaller when we incorporate texturing and shading to about 90,000 polys per render. Maybe even less if the memory is still an issue. Also, due to a fine texture projections, which warp the textures due to the camera perspective, environments I believe were often modeled with higher poly count to keep textures from stretching to infinity. Even with all that in mind, in my renders I've hardly ever even gone past 5,000. This scene here is only about 2,700 tries, and this character right here is about half of it, 1,070 polys. I'm not done with this scene at the moment, I'm probably going to add more later. Probably about a tree or another character to set on that bench there. But even after subdividing my meshes to get a more realistic number to account for a fine texturing, it only ended up being about 5,900 polys. And that's still way, way less than the limit that the PlayStation 1 could theoretically handle. So when it comes to environments and models, we really have a lot to work with. But part of the look comes from the minimalism. Alright, enough talking about theoretical crap. Let's get to modeling. When it comes to almost any given object we see or come across on a day-to-day -day basis, I feel that almost any of them could be represented simply as a series of cubes, spheres, and cylinders. Very, very few, if any, object is really triangular, pyramid-esque in shape. So you will really largely only need the cube, sphere, and cylinder. And if you want to get really simple, the plane and circle. Now, I'm feeling kind of hungry, so let's make breakfast. There's a lot of simple objects in the kitchen that we can use to get started in modeling, and we're going to end up with a scene that looks like this. This was a build that I did live on Twitch, but I feel I could streamline the whole build and condense it down to a smaller tutorial series. So, with that, let's get right to it. I'm going to assume that you have your render settings set up like I showed you last time, so I'm not going to mention it again. The first thing that we need to do is set up our units. As much as I would like my bacon strips to be 0.15 meters long, I'm neither an engineer, nor am I European enough to know whether or not that's an actually correct length. We want our objects to be believable, and by using correct units in the world space, it helps us model them by giving us context and something to go off of. If you don't use the Imperial system, I'm going to be providing on-screen measurements if you want to follow along that way. So first we're going to go over here to the Scene Properties tab, the one that looks like a drop of water and some dots, and open it. 
If you're rational, meaning you are familiar with the metric system like the rest of the world, all you need to do here is check the separate units box, and when you look at the transforms of any object, it'll break them down into meters and centimeters. If you're stupid, like I am, then we'll need to instead swap the unit system from metric to imperial. And now we have feet and inches for our units for my smooth brain to understand. Next, I want to go about setting up my scene. I want there to be a global directional lighting source, so I'm going to select this object right here, which is a point light, and I'm going to go over here to the object data properties, or this green light bulb icon, and we're going to open it up and where I can do some tinkering. I'm going to change this light from a point to a sunlight, and I'm also going to change the strength from 1000 to 5, because if you were to render a scene with a strength of 1000, you'll probably melt your eyes out. Now we're going to go about setting up our table. We're going to take the default cube and give it the love and attention that we all deserve by selecting it and going into the edit mode. The dimensions of the default cube is about 6 feet by 7 inches, or 2 meters, which is taller than most people and is bigger than any table any normal person would ever be using. We're going to hit A to select all of the vertices, and then we're going to hit S to scale, Z to confine the scale to the Z axis, and then type in 0.02 to scale the cube down to about one and a half inches. Then we're going to take our table and make it less wide. We're going to do the same thing again, hit scale, and then going to confine it to the Y axis, and then dividing it in half to three feet and three inches. All right, we're going to give our table some legs. If we go to the bottom view by hitting Control 7 on the numpad, we're going to select this face here, and then we're going to hit the I button to inset. This function is basically the same thing as if you had pressed E to extrude and then scaled it inwards along the X and Y axis. So really, we're going to be saving ourselves some time here by using inset instead. It's also more accurate as we can set how far in we want our legs to be. I'm going to go down here to this menu here, and I'm going to set the thickness to 6 inches. Now, every coffee table needs to have something to support the legs so it doesn't collapse when you put anything on it. So this new face here is what will be our wooden support area. We're going to click on it and extrude it down by about 3 and a half inches. And since we're extruding it downwards, we're going to have to make it negative so that way it goes downward. Now we're going to take the same face and inset it again by one and a half inches. Then we will take this new face and extrude it inwards about another three and a half inches. These dimensions that we put in means that these supports will have about the exact width and depth of a standard 2x4 that you can find in a lumber yard. Now we're going to add some legs. We're going to exit edit mode and we're going to add a new shape by hitting shift A. We're going to create a plane, and when we do, let's go ahead down here to this menu, and we'll set the size to about two and a half inches. Now we can go into edit mode and drag it down so we can see it. This plane will be the start of our leg, and we want it to be perfectly flush with the support structure that we just made. So if we go up here, we can find the snapping options drop down. We want to select the edge select mode here, and then click the magnet button to turn it on. Now, when we move the plane, if we drag our cursor over an edge, you will see that it will snap to the edge of that mesh. I'm going to drag this plane over here to this corner and make sure that it's nice and flush in that corner. Now, with that plane selected, we can then extrude this down by about, let's say, 28 inches. Now, that's one leg down, but we really don't want to have to do that for three other legs, so we're going to cheat, and we're going to make more with less. We're going to go over here to this little wrench icon called the Modifiers Property tab, and here we're going to add a modifier. When we open this menu, we're looking for what's called a mirror modifier. When we add it, it will reflect our work to the other side of the table, and to get the other two legs, we'll also need to select the Y axis. And with that, that's all of the legs we need. And if we make changes to our current leg, we can see that it is actually reflected in the other legs as well. Now, the mirrored legs that we just created aren't actually real as of yet. They're only projections of the mirror modifier. If we try to join our new legs to the table by going into object mode, selecting the legs, and then shift clicking to select our original table, and then hitting Control J, the other legs would just disappear. This is because we have to confirm and apply the modifier before we join it. So, in object mode, if we click apply and now select them and hit join we will now have a finished table 
And the first model in our scene is done. Let's celebrate by renaming our model over here to table, so that way whenever we want to find it later in the outliner, we can. Let's have some coffee. I always start my morning out with a coffee, so... Since most coffee mugs are cylindrical, we can just add a new cylinder here. For anything round, I prefer to use only six vertices. I've seen people use five, but I feel five vertices can be hard to work with at times because it just lacks symmetry. It doesn't play nice with the mirror modifier, so I'm sticking with six. I'll set the radius two inches and the depth to four and a half, which is the size of my favorite coffee cup. Now to move it around, I want to swap the snapping mode to face. We could take our mug, raise it up slightly, then we should be able to move it around the table like so. I feel about here is good, right on the edge of the table, to get yourself a quick sip when you want it. Of course, we're gonna need a handle to grab onto, so let's make one real quick. I'm gonna hide everything but the mug by hitting Shift H, and then with the mug selected, if I hit dot on the number pad, it should zoom right in so we can see it nice and good. I'm going to go into the right orthographic mode here by pressing 3 on the numpad, and I'm going to make a loop cut along the side here by pressing Ctrl R and then clicking away like that. Now going into face select mode, if we select these two faces and hit I, we can do an inset. Notice how these two faces that we just created are stuck together like this. We don't want that. To fix this, we're going to go down here to this drop down menu and select individual. Now we can put in our thickness as we want. I'm going to put in about 3 fourths of an inch, and that should be good. Now to make the handle, I'm going to select our new faces, and then I'm going to go to the front orthographic view, and I'm going to extrude them out like so. I'm going to change my transform position briefly to individual origins. This will allow us to scale these faces individually as opposed to from the center as you normally would. I'm going to swap back, then scale them up like this, and we're going to now start using the 3D cursor. Up to this point, we haven't really discussed it. It's that little red and white circle that you move about when you click around. When it comes to modeling, sometimes you want to have a specific point that you want to rotate around. And the 3D cursor is exactly what we're going to use to do that. I want to pivot from the median point of these two faces. With both of these faces selected, I'm going to hit Shift S to bring up this menu right here. And then I'm going to select cursor to selected. Now, the 3D cursor has moved directly between our two faces. Now we can go about finishing the handle for our mug. I'm going to swap my transform position pivot to the 3D cursor mode, which basically just says, now I want to rotate about this cursor. I'm going to select this face here, and I'm going to hit E to extrude, and then right click to reset its position back to where I had it. So now if I hit R, and we rotate around the y-axis, we can now see that we are now in fact rotating around the 3D cursor that we placed. I'm going to set our angle here to be about 45 degrees. I'm going to do that to the other side now. And one last time, we're going to select our two faces like this, and I'm going to hit Control e to bring up the edge menu. And we're going to join these two faces together by selecting Bridge Edge Loop. Our handle looks a little bit too long, it's not proportional. Speaking of proportion, we're going to fix this with a new tool called the Proportional Editing Tool. With the Face Select mode, we can select this ring of faces by holding Alt and selecting with our mouse. And a quick note about this type of selection. You want to select towards the edge in the direction you want to select in. Meaning, if I select near this edge loop, the selection will go along this way. Whereas if I select this way, it will go along that way. With their ring selected, if we just press O, you will notice a dot right next to our snapping tool has turned on. This is Blender telling us that we just turned on proportional editing. And what this means now is when I hit G, the handle will automatically adjust every vertice that is within a certain radius of the transform pivot point, or around the 3D cursor as of right now. The radius as it is right now is a bit too large, so we need to decrease it by scrolling in on the mouse wheel. And now we can move the handle in like that. We can quickly create the rest of the mug by clicking on top of here and then doing an inset and extruding it down a bit. Not all the way though, we want to fill our mug with something, so only in about, let's say, three-fourths of the way down or so. It's up to you how much coffee you want. Now, I'm going to make a plate in bowl. Really, these are just variations on the mug. It's just a cylinder that we manipulate to get exactly how we want. They are made in the exact same way, so instead of going through the whole process of explaining how we go about making them, 
I'll just give you some dimensions of the actual plate and bowl that I'm referencing. My plate is about 11 inches in diameter and about 1 inch deep, while my bowl is 5.5 inches wide and 2.5 inches deep. I'm trusting that with some of the basic modeling instructions that you've followed up to now, you'll be able to make these two objects perfectly fine. That'll be your assignment for the end of this video. We got pretty far in terms of what we made, especially if this is your first tutorial in Blender. Like in the last tutorial video, I wanted to end with a question. What are we going to have for breakfast? I don't want to just recreate the scene that I demonstrated earlier. I want to bring something new. And from the last tutorial video, a lot of people expressed interest in going towards more of a sci-fi route, and maybe even a touch of survival horror. So with that in mind, what kind of sci-fi breakfast can we create here? I'm hoping someone can maybe stump me, honestly. Myth something really interesting and complex, after all. The next video will be more advanced in terms of modeling technique. And I wanted to discuss the importance of good topology, so I want to do something a little bit more interesting than just bowls and plates. Be sure to leave those suggestions in the comments, subscribe for more videos, and I'll be seeing everyone next time. Goodbye, everyone.